We've all watched Tiger King and seen the different facilities featured in the documentary. One of the common things that um, people said was that they're all doing the same thing. They're all exploiting animals. And because Big Cat Rescue does not breed big cats, I knew that wasn't true, but I wanted to look more in depth into these claims and specifically how the facilities um, directly contribute to conservation, education, and what their animal welfare standards are. That's what we're doing today. We are looking at Myrtle Beach Safari, which is owned by Doc Ansel, one of the prominent zoos featured in Tiger King. Now, I'm Dr. Stephanie Shuttler. I am a wildlife biologist. My channel is about inspiring you to conserve the natural world and, it, and <laughs> empowering scientists. I've worked in wildlife biology since 2003, and I have worked in AZA accredited zoos and museums for about seven years. So these are zoos um, accredited by the Association for Zoos and Aquariums. One of the biggest claims that Doc Antel makes is that he funds um, conservation projects in the wild and he donates millions of dollars to such projects. I wanted to look into it to see if it was true. First, right off the bat, I've been in this field for, since 2003 and I've never heard of Doc Antel. Um, he has a nonprofit called the Rare Species Fund and I looked it up online. I have never heard of this fund either. But I wanted to look at it more carefully and actually see if they donate to um, conservation organizations. If you look at the Rare Species Fund, you'll find different tabs for different continents. Um, some of the contents have no projects in them. Others are full of projects. It's really hard though to tell if these projects are up to date. Um, and there's no mention of how much money they donate to projects. Sometimes you click on a link for a project and another document will come up and it will have um, some of the activities that they've been doing. So it looks like they fund camera trap work, um, they fund anti-poaching patrols, they build um, houses for, for local communities. And in these projects, the donation amounts that I've seen have been in the tens of thousands of dollar range. And this makes sense because um, I have a lot of experience planning um, budgets for international projects. I did my research in Gabon and I coordinated international um, projects in um, between our, our, our citizen science projects in Kenya, Mexico, India. I worked in Kenya a long time ago. Anyway, I know how much these things cost. I, we've, we, I've, I've organized or I've helped organize major camera trap projects. I know how much these budgets cost. So for Doc donating to these projects, um, it really looks like they're only donating the tens of thousands of dollars of range, at least from what I can see on the website. Again, I looked at his social media um, and he talks about these camera trap research projects. Once you get the camera traps up and running, once you get them purchased, it, it's really not expensive to run um, these projects. So again, it doesn't look like it's um, these are million dollar projects. I found it really strange that the finances um, didn't really add up, like we, like we couldn't see the final amounts. If you look at Big Cat Rescue's website, they actually put all their financial information on there so you can see exactly how they spend their money, um, as an example. I'm not saying Big Cat Rescue is the gold standard, but they're just way more transparent than Myrtle Beach Safari. I found an article on Myrtle Beach online and I'll put um, a link for that in the YouTube description. And this person, um, this journalist was doing the same thing, trying to figure out if Doc Ansel really donates um, hundred or millions of dollars to conservation. And um, one thing that they found is that he considers his conservation um, to be something called TIGERS, which is really an acronym for Myrtle Beach Safari. Tigers is the Institute for Great, Greatly Endangered and Rare Species, a wor world-renowned 50-acre wildlife preserve located in South Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Now, um, this is not a wildlife preserve. Wildlife preserves are areas set aside for native flora and fauna to flourish. They're not developed landscapes, or if they are, they're really limited developed, like hiking trails. Um, and this is a zoo. This is a private zoo. He is breeding animals to make money for it. Um, these animals are not native to South Carolina. None of these animals will be released into the wild. 
Um, so he's taking money from the nonprofit and putting it into his for-profit zoo, which I think is illegal. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert, but it doesn't sound right. Um, but regardless of that, I think the worst part of that is, is it's tricking people into think they're donating to conservation because the zoo itself is not directly linked to conservation. It, um, although he's breeding the animals, they are not bred for a species survival program, which is what the AZA does. They have, each species has its own um, program. They make sure to maximize genetic diversity in the population, the captive population. And this ensures that there's a genetic reservoir for species. So in case a catastrophe happens in the wild, they could potentially use these captive animals um, to start a reintroduction program, a breeding program, and then reintroduce them into the wild. So Doc Yantel is not part of um, these groups. The way that um, these private zoo owners tend to breed animals, they tend to breed them according to color. Um, so like there's a lot of white tigers, whereas in the wild, um, there's like never white tigers. Um, they breed ligers, something that's not, that never happens in the wild because tiger and in Asiatic lion range don't overlap. So these are not really, um, they're not preserving the natural subspecies of tigers in the wild and um, they're just really not serving any conservation purpose. So at least more than half of his money is going to a for-profit zoo um, that's, that's not doing anything for conservation. Now, it does look like he donates to some real conservation initiatives, um, and the online article um, estimated that was about $500,000 over, um, I think, four years, so about $100,000 a year. I looked into um, the types of projects. It looks like he mostly donates to camera trap research, and I'm a camera trapper. I've actually, I'm actually in a project or initiative called Wildlife Insights, and our whole goal is to get camera trap data from all over the world, from all different types of people um, conducting camera trap research. And I have still never heard of Doc Antle or this, this fund. We've been looking for funds to help support our project. Nevertheless, he does donate camera, trap, camera traps, equipment, anti-poaching patrol, and those are all great. Um, just having people on the ground definitely helps conservation efforts. It definitely reduces um, poaching. That being said, the weird thing about Doc Antle's um, Rare Species Fund is there's no information about how they distribute the funds, um, how you can get the funds, um, how, it's de how projects are determined where they're awarded funds. Now, if you're a private individual, you can donate money to whom, whatever organization you want. You don't, you don't have to report to anyone. But as a nonprofit, there should be some sort of system. There should be a board of directors that figures out where the money goes towards. How it works in conservation, in wildlife biology, is an organization will have a call out for a proposal. A lot of these are ongoing yearly grants. And then um, myself and other scientists we write up a full scientific study, we do a whole budget, and the, the grant asks for specific things. So those are, the, those are the main things that the grant asks for, um, but they might ask for like other things in addition. Then we submit our grants, they are peer reviewed by other scientists. So I've, re I've reviewed other people's grants and you rank um, how, how good they are in terms of scientific robustness, in terms of importance, conservation importance. So these are, and, and the ability of the researcher to do it. So if it's a brand new researcher, do you have a lot of trust in this person being able to um, fulfill this project, fulfill the, the project's um, stated objectives? Or is it somebody who's done this um, you know, for years and you, and you have confidence that they can do that? So even though Doc Antle is donating $500,000 um, or $100,000 roughly a year to conservation efforts, what concerns me is that um, a, lot of, a lot of conservation work, especially internationally, is people just buying products. And if the people on the ground don't know how to use them, don't use them correctly, for camera traps, if we're not using them in a systematic, um, in, a, in a structured survey design, then the data are essentially useless. Um, sure, they'll tell you if there's a tiger there or not, 
But in terms of like estimating population size, in terms of looking at um, what influences um, animals, um, whether the animal is present there or not, like, like environmental factors or human presence factors, you can't do any of that type of stuff if, it, if camera traps are just thrown out there and not done in um, a survey design. Therefore, we have no information about how um, these projects are conducted. Same thing for anti-poaching patrols. Yes, you can invest money, but you wanna know if your project's gonna be effective. And when you write grants to organizations, you usually have to demonstrate um, through your results. You have to write up reports, data, and um, I don't see any of that on Doc Antle's website. Finally, I do want to say that even if he does donate to the best conservation organizations in the world, the best projects, I still don't think it's worth it for cub petting. I view cub petting as innately cruel because the cubs are taken directly away from the mother. As you saw in the Tiger King um, docu-series, literally the minute, the second they were born, they were they had this big pole, they dragged it out, and they pulled the tiger cub through the fence, and then it was put in Joe's living room so it could become tamed by people. These tigers and other big cats, they are only used for cub petting for one month, um, between eight to 12 weeks of age, and then after that, what happens? Um, people say that they provide lifelong homes to them, that's what Doc Antle says, but no facility can house an endless supply of tigers. It's just impossible. Tigers live to be over 20 years, and um, on my website there's a blog post about cub petting where I did the math of how many tigers are born each year for cub petting, and I think the number was 50, like an average is 50. Anyway, you can't, I'll put a link to that. You can't keep breeding tigers, like just like here in this house, if I was breeding my domestic cats, which I'm not, they're spayed, but if I was, you know, eventually we're gonna run out of space. Um, so that's just like math. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that the directors of Netflix didn't put into their documentary, but the Wondery podcast talked about, and actually there was an interview with the directors um, after the um, after the documentary came out that the tigers were constantly sick, the cubs, they had bald spots, worms, um, diarrhea, so I, it's just to have one animal suffer for other animals to for the conservation of other animals, in my opinion, is not justified. It is possible that you can kind of indirectly conserve wildlife by educating the public, inspiring them, getting them excited about big cats, and then having them donate to reputable organizations. I looked at Myrtle Beach Safari's website and their um, social media pages. Um, for most zoos, they at least have pages on animals telling you species facts. Um, Myrtle Beach Safari does not really have this. They do have a couple of their animals listed, but the profiles are more about that individual animal and not, um, and not like the animal in general. Some of the information is wrong. They put all the classification information for the animal at the bottom, and they have information from... Um, big cats and chimpanzees together, and it's the same information for each animal, so that that's not accurate. I looked at their YouTube channels, and a lot of their videos are not educational. It's things like chimp making smoothies, chimps making chocolate chip cookies, which I think is worse for conservation because you're teaching people that chimpanzees are just like like pets, like like domesticated animals. I wouldn't. Well, I, we don't have our dogs make smoothies, but but it's it's not treating them like they're the rare endangered species that they are. We we learn nothing about what they are like in the wild their social behavior is manipulated. Um, you don't come away with any educational information about chimpanzees at all. And in most of these videos, there's just, there's not even talking. It's just, or at least the videos I skimmed, it, um, they're just showing these animals doing human-like things. A couple of the video, or in one of the videos, again, he says something wrong about elephants. He says the average age of an elephant is 37. I don't know how you could possibly know that across all elephants around the world, all three species. It doesn't even make sense. Um, I think what he's trying to say is that the lifespan of an elephant is 37 because before he said the longest elephant to live was 88. Um, and in which case, 37 is not true. They, live, they can live to be in their 70s. I could go on and on about the 
lack of educational value, the very, very little educational value of Myrtle Beach Safari. Um, but we'll try to make this video a little bit shorter and skip right to the animal welfare. Um, it's hard to evaluate DOC because we never saw the facilities where the animals are kept. That's a, that's a key difference between Doc Yentl and Joe Exotic and also Big Cat Rescue. In, for Big Cat Rescue and for the Greater Whittywood Zoo, we saw where the cats stayed, where they lived. In Myrtle Beach Safari, all of the cats in the film are, are dragged out onto stage or these lawn areas. And I use the word drag kind of jokingly, but in one scene there is there is a scene of a woman like literally dragging, I think it was a clouded leopard by its front legs. Um, so I'm personally against these kind of animal interactions. I think even if the animals are tamed, I think it's really stressful for the animals. It's just the animals are always constantly touched, constantly handled. They don't have a choice if they can, if they want to avoid people or not. They're forced into that situation. Whereas in um, a, a zoo where an animal is in an enclosure, if they don't want to be seen, they can, you know, they can hide, they can, they can protect themselves and away from people. That is if it has the habitat structure that um, usually better zoos have. I think Doc Antle uses um, a bull hook on Bubbles the Elephant. Um, bull hooks are these, these poles and they have pointy ends and um, people use these to control elephants. They put it behind their, their ears and the um, backs of their legs and these soft spots of elephants to cause pain for them to keep them under control. I watched this video on, um, in, on Thai elephants that were used for riding and some of these wounds are like always, they're always enduring because they're constantly being poked there. Um, I didn't see him with a, with a bull hook, but I did see him with a cane and I only saw him with a cane when he was riding bubbles. So my suspicion is that that cane acts as a bull hook when he bubbles is with people in public and then in, when he's privately with bubbles, he goes back to the bull hook. But, that's just me speculating. I don't know if that's true. Still, the fact that he's using a cane shows that it's not just a bond, it's not just love. He's keeping the elephant under control in some way. And that's the same for all of the cats. A lot of them are on leashes, or all of them are on leashes, um, at least when they're with the public. My biggest concerns of Myrtle Beach Safari are, like I said, the cub petting, and we don't know what the facilities look like. Um, in Joe's Zoo, you saw that the chimpanzees were in really simple cages. This, this was really heartbreaking to me as a wildlife biologist because chimps are so intelligent, so social. With Doc Antle's chimps, we don't know where they stay. We only see them in these public areas. and. My guess is that his animals have facilities similar to the Greater Winniewood Zoo, because if he didn't, he would probably show off these facilities. He would probably be very proud to show tigers roaming around in three acres. If you want to support zoos, um, make sure it's an ethical zoo, and I have a video to help you out with that to give you some guidelines. Check their website to see what types of conservation projects they fund. Thanks so much for watching. Next time we will talk about Joe Exotic Zoo, the Greater Winniewood Zoo. Bye.